The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCT webcast, The Cheating Economy and Integrity. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go through the webcast today, if you have any questions at all, enter them into the question box. We're hoping to get to as many of your questions as possible today. The webcast is being recorded, and you can access a link to the recording shortly after the live webinar. If you'd like to follow along with the PowerPoint presentation, you can access it via the handout pane there. It's a PDF you can download. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel if you'd like to stay engaged via Twitter. The hashtag is WCETWebcast, and you can also ask, an, ask your questions there. Today we'll move through some brief introductions, dive into panelists' perspectives, have an interactive discussion with the panelists and our moderator, get to Q&A, and then wrap up with a conclusion. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and our moderator will be sure to monitor the question box. And our moderator today is a good friend of WCET's, Dr. Vernon Smith, who's the provost at American Public University System. I'd like to go ahead and let Vernon introduce himself and then the panelists. Well, thank you so much, Megan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We are uh, glad you're with us and we hope to have an interesting and intriguing conversation and an important conversation as well. Our presenters that we're honored to have today, we'll start with Douglas Harrison. Douglas is the Associate Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Maryland University College, and we're happy that he's joining us. Additionally, we'll have Adele Lelo, our Senior Principal Product Manager at WGU Western Governors University. Additionally, from the University of Waterloo, uh, Amanda McKenzie, who is the Director of Quality Assurance and academic programs has joined us and will help round out our uh, distinguished panel for today. And with that, we would like to go ahead and turn that time over to Douglas to get going right away. Great, thanks, uh, th thanks, Vernon. I really appreciate um, the chance to be here and, and join join my colleagues. Um, I just want to start briefly um, with asking you to to imagine yourself back being a student, um, uh, or if maybe you are a student now uh, and inhabit that role actively. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, an undergraduate or a graduate community college, or research one, online, four-year liberal arts. Um, you're in a course that's using blended or hybrid learning, and you're in a fully, or you may be in a fully online course. Um, if you're at UMUC, where I uh, where I am, you're, and you're a student, you're probably a working adult military affiliated, probably have family obligations. You work hard, you work honestly, um, but regardless of your demographic profile, you, um, you're halfway through your course and you get an email from an address you've never seen and a person you don't know. And here's what the email says. Hello, I hope this finds you well. I am an online tutor and I'd like to help you take your assignments, discussions, and projects for this class to support your learning. I have helped students with this particular course before and I believe uh, you may be interested as well, and I can um, help you if you'd like. My charges are a minimum of $10 for every page and varies with the urgency of the paper, or alternatively, I charge $480 and take the whole course for you. If you may need my services, don't hesitate to contact me in reply to this email. Thank you. Well, you're alarmed. Um, you know the university offers tutoring services, but you're wondering now, did the university send this person my way? Um, if the person isn't legit, did uh, did they get your email from the classroom? Are other students using these services and handing out emails to these bad actors, or are other students letting this person into the classroom using their their credentials? Is your personal information and educational data secure? Is this the kind of thing happening often and in this class now? You you enrolled here um, as most of our students do uh, because they recognize our reputation for excellence and quality at our institutions, but now you're starting to wonder about that too. So. Second person stories like this can get a little annoying after a while, so I'll stop with, with that. But I trust the point comes into sufficient clarity here. This is happening with increasing frequency across higher education today. Um, in this and many other mutantly corrupt forms, uh, bad actors are generating an authentic work across all the modalities and learning models. And you know, your LMS or your online classroom is increasingly 
um, and, and exposed vulnerability in your institution's cyber infrastructure, again, no matter your modality. Um, so, uh, of course, we also know that, that more importantly, the quality of teaching and learning is, is at stake too. Um, you know, at UMUC, we're trying to figure out, I think, like a lot of institutions, how to grapple meaningfully in this new teaching and learning landscape we're inhabiting. And so, very briefly today, I just want to talk about um, one way that we're trying to fulfill our commitment to accountability um, with an initiative that we've been um, working on for about a year and a half that I've been leading uh, to, to, first of all, uh, give us an opportunity to reimagine integrity across our academic enterprise. We're at a, a fortuitous time in, in our institutional life with the emergence of the new learning model. And we really wanted to be intentional and proactive about articulating a positive place for the educationally beneficial and socially valuable and professionally necessary place of, of integrity um, in our teaching and learning enterprise. Uh, but we also know we live in this external context of a new cheating economy. Uh, and though I think we all would rather wish we didn't, um, we also know that if we're going to be responsible, um, uh, if we're going to be responsible to our mission and to our students, we really have to respond effectively and strategically to those contexts. And doing this wrapped around it in a way that maintains integrity as a core component of, of who we are. And so we first started by stepping back and saying, let's not worry about um, uh, first trying to stop all cheaters as the, as the definition of integrity, but really think about what's our philosophy of integrity at UMUC. And that's what the next slide really gives you a, a snapshot into, is uh, stepping back and engaging our community to say, what is the positive place of integrity? And so you can see the full statement at the, at the URL I've provided there, but fundamentally it comes down to this core concept that when we do teaching and learning right and with integrity, it's more than just avoiding or sanctioning misconduct. It really allows us to know that the student is able to do and understand and know what it is that we would think they would be able to do, know, and understand given the credentials that they've earned with us. And this allows them uh, to demonstrate those skills authentically in life and work, uh, and it supports self-determination and autonomy. And we really wanted to use this as the orienting North Star of our, of our vision. Um, and so a lot of our focus is on the teaching and learning enterprise, our, our academic culture. But we've also got a dimension of this that focuses on um, uh, the accountability and authenticity that we need. And the next slide gives you a sense of what it looks like to build out this philosophy into a conceptual framework that sees integrity as an encompassing cultural driver at an institution. Um, a lot of our initiative is focused in, in these six areas um, as, as we unpack them across, across our, our, our academic experience. But I want to focus just briefly on what it means for us to think strategically about accountability and authenticity in the new cheating economy. So the first thing we did was, was set up a concept map that the next, uh, the next slide kind of unpacks for us. And, and that's to start with the sort of um, the hot for us in our learning modality. What is our highest uh, threat risk? And so we really start with that Death Star kind of, what I like to think of as kind of a Death Star risk to integrity, um, at least in online learning. Uh, and there are analogs in, in hybrid and face-to-face and -face as well. But here is the person who hires someone for the full degree, uh, surrenders their, their PII, the personal information up front, and the, the cheating contractor um, is only, the ever, only ever in the classroom as that student and generates quality original work that's never been used anywhere else. We think that's a pretty rare scenario. First of all, it's very expensive. And second of all, um, most people, even if they're willing to cheat in academia, aren't, don't wanna give up their social security number. But we really started by identifying what's the maximal threat, even if we think it's, it's pretty rare. And then we worked our, our way down from there to uh, you know, hiring out courses, hiring out parts of courses, giving the person access to the classroom, just having the material um, provision to the student, uh, then there's academic, academic misconduct that we're all much more familiar with, uh, the things that we spend a lot of our time working on uh, day in and day out. And then there's the mass distribution of our teaching and learning materials, especially our summative assessment materials on hundreds of third-party commercial websites uh, without authorization. Uh, we, we, we include this as part of the, the new cheating economy and link it to contract cheating because a lot of the same sites that are facilitating contract cheating transactions to, with, uh, with um, uh, alleged service providers uh, are also the sites that are, are distributing, distributing our material without authorization. So we took this threat, threat, threat spectrum and, and uh, sort of stripped it across uh, the, the, the next slide. And I wanted to stop for a second and, and use this as a point of, of reflection for you all with me and us, is to think about these threats to teaching and learning or what the analogs of them are for you in your modality and learning model. And think about how many tools or strategies do you, does your institution have in place or in development to respond to this threat spectrum. 
because this is really the new landscape that we're in. It used to be that we largely talked about lapses of integrity and uh, it's happening in that middle channel of academic misconduct. But we've now got this much vaster context of threats that have emerged with the new cheating econ economy around contract cheating that we really have to be actively and strategically solving for. And so the last thought I wanna show you is uh, the approach, the strategic approach that UMUC is taking given who we are in our, our modality. And, and what you see here, I hope, is that we've put together a suite of tools that when you combine them with effective teaching and learning uh, for both the domain skills necessary to teach and learn with integrity and to in integrate in integrity into the fields and disciplines, uh, strong faculty development to support our faculty to know how to do this. How do they teach these domain skills? How do they actively engage in disciplines? Wrap those around with some technologies that we're developing or acquiring, and we're trying to address as much of this threat spectrum as we can. Very quickly, I'll just tell you about these tools, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to, to my colleagues. First is a behavioral biometric tool that's passively monitoring uh, students' digital fingerprints. So it establishes that at their, the first point of entry with us into our cyber ecosystem. And then we're scoring against that digital fingerprint throughout their time in the classroom as they enter and move through it uh, so that we really can uh, be assured that the student is the student um, and, and know that we're protecting their, their data and privacy. Second is uh, the integration of Turnitin into the classroom. We use Turnitin, but we can be better and more systematic about that. And with integration comes access to Turnitin's um, feedback studio uh, tools that have a real developmental orientation to them and allow us to, to really live out our developmental orientation to teaching and learning by using this tool in a more educationally uh, focused way. Alongside that, we've got a tool that we're developing, it's, auth it's authorship authentication. And this tool really allows us to establish a, a voice print similar to the digital fingerprint uh, in the previous tool, but a voice print that says, this is, this is what this student really is, sounds like in their writing. Um, we build in through machine learning an allowance for what uh, would be uh, expected improvement in their writing over time. And then we score against that uh, that baseline to see if there, if there are aberrant variations in, in the writing voice, which could signal, uh, could signal an inauthentic, uh, an inauthentic submission. Uh, this would work alongside assignments turned, submitted to turn it in, um, because we know sometimes original work goes to turn it in that's never entered the ecosystem before. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So this would capture uh, those instances as well. Uh, and it would also be able to work in parts of the classroom that aren't covered by Turnitin, so the discussion forums and areas of, uh, uh, of uh, quizzes and, and assignment knowledge checks. Uh, we're also building a bot crawler tool to, uh, the, you may have heard of these before, uh, to go out and, and to hoover up our materials on the, the hundreds of sites we've identified and use machine learning to, to know which of those things we want to take down our assessments. We have to leave student work up. We don't want to take down uh, our openly licensed materials, but we really do want to get our proprietary assessments down. And then this tool will mass generate take down notices to, to periodically send to, to the site owners. And then finally, integrating our misconduct adjudication into a CRM platform that's integrated with all of these tools so that when data coming from them need to be part of an academic misconduct adjudication, they're integrated into a single document warehouse. That's one example of how uh, we as an institution have tried to take an authentic and, and um, mission aligned approach to these threats to integrity. Uh, and I hope it gives you a sense of, of, of one way to go about this um, that, that we're, we're, we're exploring. So I appreciate the, the chance to share with you. Thank you so much, Douglas. And, and what, a, what a fantastic uh, layout and framing for, for what's going on in, in terms of the, the problems that we're, and the challenges that we're, con we're confronting. Uh, we'll now go to Adele and uh, continue the conversation with deeper insight uh, and to what's going on with their work around this with Western Governors University. Adele? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure being with all of you today. Uh, my name is Adele Lelo. I'm the Senior Principal Product Manager over Verification of Competency and Transcript at Western Governors University. Now, what that means in plain English is that I oversee our portfolio of assessment delivery technology and everything that comes with it, including the assessment uh, security technology. We're an online, uh, nonprofit, fully accredited, competency-based institution with uh, current enrollment of uh, over 100,000 students and more than 100,000 graduates. Um, at WGU, we work very hard on protecting the academic integrity and validity of our degrees. So let me start by telling you about uh, one of the most eye-opening moments um, uh, when, when we learned about some of the predatory 
advertising techniques uh, that some of these companies within the cheating economy were using to reach university students. Um, specifically, the use of social media. Uh, they seem to identify social media groups that are created by students for the sake of staying connected, uh, motivation, and kind of generally creating an online community of others who attend the same institutions, uh, which is great. However, we learned pretty quickly that some companies and individuals um, were using these groups to actively advertise their services. They were sending inbox messages to group members, in some cases even emailing students directly. Uh, they seemed to advertise their services in a way that would lead someone who is not aware of these predatory practices to, to believe that there was nothing wrong with utilizing them uh, for the sake of completing academic work on their behalf. Some techniques almost gave out the vibe that the practice is approved by institutions. Uh, it was a moment of uh, realization for us uh, of just how organized some of these organizations are and that, that they will utilize whatever tools uh, are at their disposal to reach uh, our students. Now, the verification of skills and competencies is at the very heart of higher education's role uh, and responsibility to both our students and the employers in the marketplace. Uh, employers uh, want to know and must trust that we have verified competencies relevant to jobs for which they're hiring. Our degrees, certifications, micro-credentials, or really any other form of verified skills uh, must be credible uh, in order to provide value to students as well as employers. Um, we believe that if trust in our ability to uh, credibly verify these competencies is lost, the value of our degrees and credentials is, is greatly diminished. Um, as such, the credibility, uh, say authenticity and security of the assessments uh, should be at the very center of everything we do in higher ed. It is important, very important to note that all institutions of higher education are facing this issue. It is in no way, shape, or form uh, exclusive to online universities at all. Now, WGU students take an average of more than 40,000 online proctored assessments, uh, more than 30, more than 3,000, and I have some of this on the next slide, if we will. Uh, they take more than 3,000 certification assessments and around 1,000 site-delivered objective assessments every single month. Additionally, they submit more than 100,000 performance assessments, or as you may know them as papers, essays, uh, and projects every single month. We utilize uh, proctoring services from third-party providers for the delivery of all objective assessments. This includes the use of live, uh, low-ratio online proctoring for all of our online proctored assessments. Uh, for rubrics-based grading of performance assessments, we utilize uh, internal evaluators who are subject matter experts uh, in their uh, respective fields. Now, all of our performance assessments are automatically run through one of our two contracted plagiarism detection tools to check for originality. Uh, additionally, we have an internal team of more than 25 full-time employees who make up our assessment authenticity and security department. Uh, they utilize a variety of tools, uh, including the mentioned plagiarism detection tools, but also a custom built uh, web crawler, which searches for WGU assessment items, which may have been exposed and are posted on the internet. Um, our team uh, works with websites to remove uh, any and all uh, of our content that might be posted on those websites uh, swiftly. Now, recognizing that um, um, constantly reacting to these issues was not a good long-term solution, uh, we decided to become proactive. In order to protect our alumni, current students, uh, and those who are going to go through our programs in order to improve their situation in life in the future, we decided to go after the source of the cheating economy, the predatory websites who offer contract cheating services to university students everywhere. Uh, we conducted, uh, just earlier this year, a, a multi-month undercover investigation 
uh, which included a number of our secret shoppers uh, to pose as university students and reach out to some of the better known websites. Uh, many of them are often utilized as tutoring services and studying tools amongst uh, university students from all walks of life. We knew that most of these websites had legal disclosures, which included statements that um, uh, protect them um, against any legal action. Um, basically, they were not allowing, or through their statements, they were not allowing individuals to submit academic work uh, as their own to their institutions. So we decided to put that to the test. Uh, we started purchasing papers uh, for prices that ranged anywhere from $8 to $90 per paper, uh, then inquired with the websites about the specifics of their disclosures. This included uh, clearly stated intent that our secret shoppers were going to turn the work performed by their hired quote unquote tutors into their institutions as their own work. Uh, the results were very conclusive. We encountered very little and honestly, in most cases, no pushback on those plans. The writers or tutors, as you will, gave us clear green lights to turn these papers in as our own work. As a result of this investigation, WGU is currently taking legal action against some of these predatory websites. Our intent is to further raise awareness of the issue and together with all of you, take steps to further protect the validity of our credentials and the credibility of our industry. Unfortunately, I cannot discuss much further the details of the legal action um, we're taking right now as it is underway as we speak. So again, thank you very much for having me and I look forward to uh, answering some questions. Well, thank you for the uh, real color commentary and I think uh, as we look at this, we can see that um, there's this definite uh, uh, benefit to understanding what is going on in the economy and having an awareness of all the different ways this is interacting. Um, with that, we also want to talk about and, and look at the way to address these things in a cultural uh, approach. And we're going to turn it over to Amanda McKenzie, uh, who uh, were joining us from the University of Waterloo to discuss a, a broader and framing approach that really this comes down to a values uh, proposition as well as understanding the philosophy that's, that's uh, important for institutions to adopt and to reinforce. Amanda? Thank you, Vernon. I just wanted to start off by saying I'm just astounded by the diversity of people who have signed up for today's webcast. I see that there are a number of people from all sorts of areas of educational institutions, such as provosts, deans, librarians, faculty members, and instructional and learning support people and staff, not only across the United States, but uh, my colleagues in Canada, a number of them are tuning in, as well as internationally from Greece, Mexico, Russia, Australia, and Nigeria. This just goes to show um, the scope of this problem that you are right, um, Adele, in saying that this is uh, something that every higher institution, educational institution, is struggling with right now. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Director of Quality Assurance of Academic Programs. I oversee both quality assurance and academic integrity at the University of Waterloo. Uh, this is a public university. We have about 32,000 students and we're about an hour outside of Toronto. I've been involved with academic integrity for the past six years and I've given talks about integrity in Greece, the Czech Republic, India and in parts of North America. I've also worked in academic integrity provincially, uh, nationally as co-founding the Canadian branch of the International Centre for Academic Integrity, or ICAI, and internationally I'm currently on the board of directors for the ICAI. Uh, one other note is that I'm also involved with a national research project in Canada on contract cheating, as well as a provincial subgroup that's working on addressing contract cheating as well. So uh, one of the things that we decided we would do with the webcast is to share some personal stories. And I'd like to share a story about um, a student a number of years ago who uh, I had an interaction with. And I think this just goes to show the level of 
ingenuity and deception and the lengths that some of these contract cheating companies and um, note sharing websites will go to to engage students. My example is actually a note sharing website company, but I think it's still applicable. I had a student at the beginning of a summer a few years ago uh, who called me and wanted to ensure that she wasn't breaking any university rules. Uh, she went on to tell me that she had answered an ad in a local online marketplace, which is something similar to like a Craigslist. And she was uh, responding to an ad to work as an intern for one of the major note sharing companies. She believed that this company was in some way endorsed by the University of Waterloo because the ad had actually used our physical address. What the company was asking her to do was to share her old notes and to ask her peers to share her old notes. The hook for her was not only being able to be paid for work that she had already done and notes she had already taken, but the company had said that her contributions would lead to a donation of books to needy children in Gambia. Plus, the more she contributed, the more donations that would be sent overseas. So she was thinking that she was doing a really good deed, not only helping her fellow students, but also children in Africa. So soon after she started to work for this company, uh, she noticed that she was being um, asked to provide not only her notes and her friend note, her friend's uh, notes and materials, but also old exams, assignments, midterms, and essays. And this began to make her feel very uncomfortable. And this is where I applaud this student. She was very uh, proactive. She reached out to the Office of Academic Integrity here for advice. And we had a conversation and she was shocked to hear that this company had used the university's address without permission. So she was uh, um, shocked to learn that they weren't actually affiliated with the university and even more disappointed to learn that what she was doing was considered academic misconduct. However, when one door closes, another opens. And I was so impressed with her level of integrity to seek clarification about her situation that I immediately offered her an opportunity to work for the Office of Academic Integrity and to share her story and inform other students. And for her and I both, it turned out to be a win-win. Uh, she still had a job that would support her as a student. And I had an exemplary example of a student who could promote academic integrity on camp campus. Um, so that's just a little story from um, uh, our end of, end of the world. I was going to go on to talk about a few things that um, I think culturally that we can help to support integrity. We've talked about different strategies that you can use to uh, stem contract cheating today. And those are great, and I advocate for those, but they don't fully address the true issue at its heart, which I believe that we really need to focus on creating the culture of integrity based on the six values that the International Center for Academic Integrity has been promoting for the last few years. And they are very simple. If we get students to think of these, um, and staff members and faculty as well, these are values and behaviors that most people operate with every day. They are very basic and um, easily uh, used. I think we need to promote these values in order to set the expectations that we have for our students and our faculty and our staff. And it has to be done at all levels. Um, I think too often we focus on the students, but we all have a role to play on campus. We also need to widely educate the campus about the academic rules and what proper scholarship is if we're going to set up students to succeed. And I found numerous times that a number of people um, in different settings, faculty, senior admin, colleagues, just don't have the depth of knowledge about the academic rules and how they apply as they should. So this is crucial. Also, I think we need to uh, obviously promote the values that I mentioned and set our expectations for students and we need to make sure that they're accountable to these values, which means we need to maybe revisit our policies and make sure that they are clear and understandable and that we have appropriate penalties in place um, that will help guide us as we tackle any misconduct issues. In regards to penalties, I'd like to say that they don't always have to be punitive. There's definitely ways that we can use to um, educate and provide more information rather than being punitive. Next slide, I'm just going to touch on some of the examples that we've used at the University of Waterloo. I will say that we do have the benefit of having a central office dedicated to academic integrity, which is not always common at other institutions. I would really advocate for this model as it gives the office a campus-wide view 
of what is going on in the different um, schools and faculties, and also gives you a way of centrally um, tackling things and creating initiatives. I'll give you a little example. If we didn't have an Office of Academic Integrity at the University of Waterloo, we might not have been able to resolve an issue that cropped up um, last fall. Last fall, we had a number of signs um, that littered the roads around the university advertising a note sharing website. So much so that a number of people on campus were thinking that this company was actually something that the university endorsed or was some way credible. Um, a number of people reported that to the Office of Academic Integrity and because there was a central point contact, a, a point person, I was able to work with our legal counsel and to contact our local bylaw department and actually have these signs removed. And I think that was a pretty powerful um, action and also a proactive way to let those companies know that there are ways and uh, strategies that we can use to try and reduce the ways that they promote themselves and the ways they come off as being legitimate to um, people on our campus. Some other things that the Office of Academic Integrity has done was poster and video campaigns. And what we do in our campaigns is we always point to promoting the resources that we have on, student, or on campus for students, which would be our writing centers, um, our health centers, counseling centers, our libraries, et cetera. In the past, these campaigns have focused more on uh, students. And in more recent times, we have geared them towards different people on campus, such as deans uh, speaking on behalf about academic integrity, the president of the university speaking about academic integrity, right up until the, uh, the posters that I've shared with you um, today, which more are uh, aimed at framing what the values are of integrity uh, to really make them tan tangible, and not just for students, but for everyone on campus. Another way that we promote integrity is we do promotional giveaways and we have ads featuring our motto, motto which is work, study, play with integrity, which again is not just student focused, but um, is from the ground up with everyone on campus. One of the very unique things that we've done at the University of Waterloo was to pioneer and implement a staff workshop on integrity. This was so popular um, once it was started in 2013 that it's now become one of the core recommended courses for all new employees at Waterloo. So quite proud of that and um, would encourage other institutions to look at different ways that they can promote integrity um, beyond just targeting students. Back to students though, because they are our focus, is we have created a mobile app location that is available on um, phones that addresses integrity. And this is something that is based on scenarios and goes through scaffolded decision-making to help get students thinking about the six values. So it doesn't focus per se on um, terms like plagiarism or um, talking about citation per se. It doesn't go into depth about that, but it really keeps it higher level about how the values of honesty, trust, respect, fairness, responsibility, and courage are threaded into everything that we do. Uh, something that we have had in place for a number of years now for our graduate students um, is our graduate academic integrity module. And the way that this one differs, other than it's for graduate students, is that it exists in our learning management system. So the mobile application is something that's actually um, a new uh, development, and it's something that we created so that students didn't have to be tied to a learning management system, that they could access this information pre-arrival before they came on campus, so they had a better understanding about the uh, academic expectations, the values that the uh, University of Waterloo um, uh, believes in. I will also just mention that this mobile app is available on iTunes and Google Play. Uh, you can use it as a guest. Uh, there are also opportunities for different institutions if they'd like to customize this. This is uh, open access content and it was made with the intention of being shared provincially and nationally and internationally so we could have the broadest um, utility to most people who, who really are looking for a way to educate students about integrity. I will just say that also I'm quite proud that the app also just won an international e-learning award, um, which we received in Coos, Greece, just at the end of September. So it's getting some great recognition and I'm very proud of that initiative as well. One other piece uh, that I will also say is that really being active in the field is key. 
uh, tuning into webcasts like the one today, participating in your local associations, maybe provincial or state groups, nationally and internationally with the Acad International Center for Academic Integrity. And one of the important factors that uh, is coming up actually tomorrow is the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating. And I'll speak about that in a couple more slides. The next slide, I just wanna highlight um, a couple of the posters. If we could go to the next slide, there we go, great. Um, the two posters on the left are ones that were created that are supposed to be applicable to pretty much anyone who is on campus. The top one more so, um, to students as well as the older generation. But the bottom one um, is a little bit more tongue in cheek for people my age who would actually know what that yellow thing is. Um, so that was more geared to staff and faculty and administrators to really highlight that um, it, it, integrity is timeless. It's something that we all need to um, pay attention to and role model every day. Embedded in this presentation is also a video. Uh, we won't play it now, but um, definitely please have a look at it at your leisure. It's an example of a video that we did to um, promote integrity to our students on campus. The next slide shows a couple of the promotional items that we use at the University of Waterloo. There are buttons that say Integrity Matters, promoting our Office of Academic Integrity website, which by the way also has resources for faculty, uh, staff, and students. We have post-it notes that we provide to all incoming students. So 6,000 of these post-it notes go into the orientation kits of all incoming students. And uh, about uh, 1,600 go towards incoming graduate students every term. And again, we're focusing on the work study play with integrity motto. Uh, the last piece on this image is um, the student that I actually mentioned in my in my story. This is a student that had the experience with the note sharing website who I hired to um, assist me with promoting integrity on campus. And this highlights one of the stencils that we used uh, across campus in strategic locations where we knew there'd be a lot of high uh, student traffic with people walking over it and uh, just to keep it top of mind for those who are on campus. The next slide focuses on the mobile app. You'll see on the left, there's an image of what the app looks like when you log on. I will note that this app is available in uh, English, basic Chinese, Mandarin, and French. So it is in three languages. Our goal was to try and make it accessible to a number of our students uh, population, not only here on the University of Waterloo campus, but also uh, pre-arrival and worldwide. We've actually had other schools interested in translating um, this app into uh, potentially Spanish, as well as Punjabi. So there is uh, definitely interest and uh, ability to scale this in different directions, depending on what um, different institutions are interested in. The video to the right is just a little video that highlights what the app is and a little bit more about it. And I just wanted to end off about why integrity is crucial. So why do we do this? Why do educational institutions really need to pay attention to this? Well, not only is it foundational to academia and what we do, but we are really setting up students to go out into the workforce and into their career and into the world. And I particularly like this quote from Warren Buffett. And uh, it really highlights the fact that if you don't have someone that has integrity, it really can come back to haunt you. And I think that's all the role that we have is to help students get off on the right foot and to maintain that integrity throughout the rest of their life path. The very last slide promotes tomorrow, October uh, 17th, which is the International Day of Action. This is the third day, or, or third year, sorry, that this International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating has been held. It's a unified stand against the contract cheating uh, industry by educational institutions around the world. There are different hashtags that we ask people to use that will uh, spread the word on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And this is to raise awareness and get more support and resources to combat this issue. So if you haven't signed up as an educational institution already, we um, hope that you will do so. Um, you can also sign the online petition by Turnitin and sign up as a school to participate in whiteboard declarations. 
and hosting events uh, to inform in schools, uh, schools, ugh, can't talk, students and other people on campus um, about the importance of, of standing up against this contract cheating. There's also a toolkit to combat uh, contract cheating that was available from the institution or International Center for Academic Integrity, which if you haven't downloaded it already um, on the website for the ICAI, there's a link and I would suggest that you check out that toolkit and see how it could apply to your campus. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was a, a great uh, positive way of, of looking at this in, in terms of the long view. And for all of our participants, um, one of the things I think that's important to realize is that there is a cost to this. Um, it may not be a cost that we've anticipated in the past, but there are, is definitely a cost to not only being prepared for breaches in academic uh, integrity, but also, frankly, the effort to go out, go after some type of contract cheating and take it down, there's a financial cost and a burden upon the institution itself. Um, one incident may run into the thousands of dollars uh, in, that, in that process. And so this is an important issue that not only faculty care deeply about already, I believe, uh, the uh, CFOs, the chief academic officers and presidents should be uh, concerned about this as well, and of course, the legal offices. You know, I had a couple of questions here that came up during the time. Douglas, I'd like to point this first one or have you uh, react to this first one. You know, given the scale of this new cheating economy that was being described, how do you keep the enormity of this threat and challenge uh, from taking over an institution's focus on integrity and quality? Yeah, well, well, thanks, Brennan. It's, it is a really, it is a really important question. I think, and the first thing that I think we have to do institutionally is make a distinction between academic integrity and academic misconduct. Um, and, and then commit as an institution to building and maintaining robust cultures of integrity. Uh, certainly accountability, including accountability for and the defenses against the contract cheating and the way we've been talking about, they absolutely have to be part of that culture. But reacting uh, to lapses of integrity is not the primary reason that we build and invest in cultures of integrity. So first is articulating the positive role of integrity. And then we can't assume the givenness of, of the definitions that we have in higher, higher education of integrity. We can't assume that students come on board with us sharing those. It's not that students don't have integrity, but the radical openness of the internet, there's a lot of great research out there, we've done some ourselves, we've confirmed it, has really transformed perceptions of and the values about authenticity and originality. The online culture of remix and reuse and pastiche, think about every cat meme you've ever created or received on social media. This remix culture has completely scrambled the post-enlightenment consensus about what was once the near sacred status of originality in free society. Many of our students, and not just the kids these days, our, our research really confirms that students across the age spectrum shows that they're coming to the classroom with very different ideas about the status of others' ideas and their creations and what is yours and what is mine and what is theirs. So we have to be intentional and consistent in engaging students in the classroom about integrity what it is, not just the skills to avoid cheating, but what it means to operate with integrity in a given field or a discipline or a career. And that can be a shift for a lot of faculty and, and institutions who tend to see integrity as something that should happen before the student gets to my classroom or something that is they as the faculty do stop and only do when they're when they're detecting or punishing cheaters. So in other words, integrity, you know, it really is the work of institutional transformation and it won't happen without intentional investments and commitments that go not just toward reactions and along, along accountability for contract cheating, but really look at the entire teaching and learning enterprise. Thank you so much, Douglas. You know, the understanding those boundaries is certainly a dynamic environment um, in these days. You know, looking at another question, Dell, you know, if an organization does have limited resources, what are your suggestions to uh, protect against the cheating economy? You know, what's going to be a, a great first step to get the most bang for the buck at an institution that's trying to confront this? That is probably one of the top questions on everyone's mind. In other words, what do you do with limited resources to protect against this problem? Well, first thing you do, and you're well on your way there as evidenced by attending this webinar is, is so congratulations, is recognize that all institutions, whether you're online, traditional, hybrid, can have this problem. This requires no resources, the recognition of the potential of this issue. Um, now that you have recognized that 
there is an issue, uh, another kind of very low resource draining step uh, you can take is to start working on creating a culture of, of uh, academic integrity amongst your students. Uh, that was mentioned a couple of times already. We believe that the overwhelming majority of students will not utilize these services if they are aware of the nature of them. Lastly, I would encourage you to focus on high levels of security for your assessment delivery processes. If you're utilizing online proctoring, for example, ensure that you are using high security level of online proctoring services. If you're grading papers, essays, or other types of projects, uh, ensure that you put submissions through plagiarism detection software. There are many ways to increase the level of academic integrity, uh, but it all starts with awareness. Um, awareness alone can increase the limited resources you have available. Um, so I guess long story short, awareness and uh, uh, increased resources. Adele, a question from the audience is, you know, how does uh, your, the work that you're doing at WGU, uh, how do other institutions join you in that, uh, that process of, of supporting the work that you're doing? Well, we are always open and available, and we have we are always on the lookout for like-minded institutions who um, would like to tackle this problem with us. The easiest way to uh, start a conversation is just reach out directly to us. Reach out directly to me, Adele A D E L dot Lelo L E L O at wg.edu, and let's talk. Fantastic. Amanda, you know, you suggested that penalties don't necessarily need to be punitive, but um, you do recommend that an institution have both a penalty system and in tandem with, you know, strong educational uh, values. What are your thoughts around that? Thanks. Um, I, I think you have to have a bit of both. Uh, we can't be too lenient with um, letting people push the boundaries of our, our values and our rules. So I think number one, what both um, Douglas and Adele touched on is the awareness piece. I think we really just need to talk about the uh, expectations, what the academic rules are, making sure everyone has an understanding. Um, also making our policies clearly understood, accessible, um, so again, students aren't too far removed from what we expect of them. Uh, I know parts of the things that we worked on at the University of Waterloo is to make more of a spectrum of our penalties in regards to plagiarism. So instead of being very rigid, we've worked recently to um, have a graduated uh, structure of penalties. We've also done recent work, which we haven't released yet, but are hoping to shortly uh, about also doing the same with our penalties in regards to unauthorized collaboration. And of course, we know that students really struggle with this and where the line is for them to, um, to not cross, where it goes into too much assistance, too much work with other students. Uh, so this is something that we proactively are looking at. And again, um, we've, we've called in, I think, students to also advise us. And I think that that's a strength if you're revising your policies and the way you um, look at academic integrity and assess your penalties uh, to bring them in. I will say also that we have a remedial workshop which we use with first-time unintentional uh, offenders, let's call them, and we find that this is really useful in giving them the tools they need to um, understand more about the academic rules because some of them just don't know what they don't know. Thank you, Amanda. You know, and I'll sort of ask the same question as I did with Adele. You know, what's the single most important thing, you know, educators can do to address this uh, contract cheating or, or uh, related behaviors? It goes back to really talking about it. It would be so useful if the people that are in front of students the most or have that um, firm connection and attention of the student would have a discussion about um, academic integrity walk through their expectations, talk about group work. Imagine that students have maybe five instructors a term and each instructor might have different rules about group work, not only in their course, but for different assignments in their course. So no, uh, uh, it's no surprise that students find that this is a bit of a struggle. It's also proven in research that if uh, faculty members, instructors, um, and other people on campus 
uh, recognize that it's important and they stress it and they, they provide um, uh, state that it's got value, then students will pay attention. They will know that it's something of importance that they really need to um, engage with and follow the rules. I remember there was an article once that talked about um, a university where everyone got to shake, I think, the president's hand as they joined and sort of in an honor code ritual, but also, um, you know, uh, pledging that they will maintain academic integrity. And they found that that was highly successful. And the reason being is because they knew that someone cared about it and that um, it was valued at their institution. So I think we really need to have those open conversations about it and lay out uh, the expectations and uh, just keep talking about it. Amanda, going back to the remedial course that you do at University of Waterloo, is that when a, a, there's a violation occurs, do you require students to go and take that, that remediation? Depending on the type of violation, if they're um, uh, like a junior student and this is a very unintentional offense, then yes, they would be um, permitted to join this remedial workshop. Thank you. You know, Douglas, this is obviously a very popular topic with lots of things, and I don't know if we're going to have enough time to do all of this, but, you know, looking at why do we not hear more about this in the forums and spaces where higher education, you know, engages this thing? You know, what is it about that that we haven't heard more about this? You know, Adele said every institution has this. What, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, it's a fascinating paradox to me, and I, I mean, I, I, I think about this a lot. Um, uh, as I do this work. I think a couple observations come to mind. Um, first, a few months ago, I spoke to a group of senior academic administrators from multiple institutions, a variety of institutional types represented there. Um, most were, were more traditional um, uh, kind of uh, bricks and mortar residential institutions. And I talked about this comprehensive, uh, you know, transformative kind of approach that UMUC is modeling for investing in integrity, taking a lot of the kinds of, of developmental approaches that Amanda's talking about, cultural change. And I essentially invited them to reflect on and, and, and to consider what it would look like to initiate these kinds of things at their institutions. And there was a curious response from a, a subset of them. And essentially the response was, you know, we already are committed to integrity, that's obvious. And making a big splashy recommitment to integrity that includes strategic responses to contract cheating, you know, there was a lot of concern about it being misunderstood as saying we're compromised or we're somehow at risk. And I think this was illustrative to me of why this issue is so looming and yet it's so lost in the intentional spaces we use to talk about trends and threats. And so I think there's a real reticence, reticence to push past the surface of genuine, but general commitments to integrity and grapple meaningfully with the kinds of things that we've been talking about here from the teaching, learning, cultural stuff, all the way down to the, the threats assessment and, and um, defensive and reactive uh, tools and, and strategies. Um, you know, my second observation would be that uh, the relatively muted engagement with this issue, issue in the U.S. is really out of sync with much of higher education globally. Um, a structured and systematic and professionalized focus on integrity is very much the norm in Europe and Australia and South America, Canada, Africa, really all the places that, that Megan talked about our, our colleagues hailing from in this webinar. Um, so it may not be all of the rest of the world, but, but um, uh, you know, the U.S. Is, is really lagging here, I think, in, in uh, approaching this in a, a professionally structured kind of way. And so I think today isn't really the day to unpack why that is, but I offer it as another kind of uh, data point to help us understand where we are and how we need to evolve this conversation and focus on integrity in the collaborative ways that Adele and um, uh, Amanda, and, and I, I certainly would, would second them, have, have indicated. Um, and I, I would offer to, you know, to reach out to me as well um, uh, and, and, and build, build this coalition that we'll need to really grapple with this um, effectively at scale. Thanks, Douglas. You know, Adele, a question, a clarification. Uh, whether you stated that an overwhelming number of students will not use contract cheating services if they know that the, the institution knows about it, if that makes sense. In other words, will students be less likely to use those services uh, if they know that the university knows about it or the college? I believe that the majority of students will not use the services, not because the university knows about it, but it because they are aware of what is happening in the marketplace. We do not believe that the student is the problem here. We believe that the problem is the predatory practice or the predatory practices used by these predatory organizations and individuals to solicit those students. 
So yes, I do believe if students are aware of of what the problem is and what kind of an issues it presents to to them and the organization uh, or institution, we do not believe that they will use them um, the vast majority of the time. Appreciate that so much. You know, Amanda, um, there's been research that shows that folks, if they're reminded of academic integrity right before they have a chance or are tempted to do something, they're less likely to do that. Do you see any behavior uh, or, or nudges that we can give students to help remind them that they can maintain their, their integrity? Again, I think it goes back to talking. So anyone who has a face-to-face -face interaction with students, whether that be um, uh, peer advisors, tutors, instructors, just to really role model and uh, identify what the rules are and to adhere to integrity, I think, is, is really important. And I think with the messaging, part of the reason why we did our uh, spray-painted stencil across campus was really to keep it top of mind. Um, the issue of academic integrity doesn't go away, but we only tend to talk about it when there's a crisis or a scandal. Um, and I'd like to flip that and have us talk about it more regularly and celebrate instances where we have integrity. Maybe we should do more celebration of the positive pieces that we have rather than giving um, radio time to some of the more negative examples out there. Thank you. Adele, I ask a quick real question. You know, is this an online problem? Is this a, uh, you know, Western problem or, or is it, where is it? Where, where are we seeing this happen? I do not believe that in any way, shape or form is this an online colleges exclusive problem. If you look at this from the perspective of these predatory websites uh, for a moment, uh, do you think they really care whether a student is attending an online institution, a traditional institution, a hybrid program? Do you think it matters whether a student is completing her undergraduate or graduate program? I, I don't think so. They will, uh, in my opinion, more likely than not solicit any student uh, they can reach. So I believe this is a problem encountered by institutions, big and small, online, uh, brick and mortar, uh, across the board. Uh, I believe that the sooner we recognize that we can all be affected by this, uh, the sooner we can focus on solving the issues at hand. Thanks so much, Adele. Um, I think all of us are, have a heightened awareness because of this, and certainly we're appreciative of WCET, who I know for a fact cares deeply about this, and these are all things that impact the standards. It is always a good thing to hold to high standards and to be aware of the things that can compromise our integrity, because in the end of the day, that's all we have as institutions and as individuals is our integrity. Um, and we're very appreciative to Douglas Harrison, Adele Lalo, and Amanda McKenzie for being part of this. I'm Vernon Smith from American Public University System. We care about these issues and we're so glad you joined us. Megan, would you like to uh, give some final words and help wrap this up for uh, WCET? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Vernon, and thank you for all of the panelists. Thank you for the great conversation taking place in the back channel. We had wonderful, wonderful questions that we just did not have a chance to address during this conversation, but we'll be sure to pull out a lot of those questions and provide written responses back to you all because this was some excellent, excellent fodder for future work. If this is your first entree to WCET, visit our website and learn more about us and the work we do. Consider joining. We have our annual meeting coming up next week. It's right around the corner. We're going to be in Portland, Oregon. So if you are in the area, be sure to register and join us. We'll be having conversations very similar to this on a wide range of topics around digital learning and higher education. Again, it was mentioned that this was recorded, and you will receive a link from GoToWebinar shortly after this recording. We'll also make a captioned version and post that on our YouTube channel and link that to the WCET webcast page that Lindsay posted into the chat. So be sure to check. We'll have that posted by Friday, and then feel free to distribute that link broadly. Thank you to our WCET supporting members and lastly, our sponsors that help underwrite much of our programming and events here at WCET. So we hope to see you on the next webcast. We have one in partnership with OLC on October 31st about accessibility, and you can learn more about that on our website as well. So again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to Vernon for facilitating, and thank you so much for your time and participation. Have a good day.
Thank you, everyone. Bye.